Proteins are vital for the normal function of a cell. Essentially, a protein is, at its simplest, a very long chain of individual units, called amino acids, bound to each other by peptide bonds to form an amino acid chain. They sort of resemble a string of beads, and they get twisted and folded into a final protein shape. To make a protein, we need to get to know two things, the ingredients, which are the amino acids, and the recipe, or how the finished amino acid chain folds into the protein. Humans use 20 amino acids in our day-to-day -day protein making. So we have alanine, arginine, asparagine, aspartic acid, cysteine, glutamic acid, glutamine, glycine, histidine, isoleucine, leucine, lysine, methionine, phenylalanine, proline, serine, threonine, tryptophan, tyrosine, and valine. Phew, that's 20. One way to divide these is into the ones that we make ourselves and the ones that we cannot make ourselves. There are five amino acids that are dispensable. Alanine, asparagine, aspartic acid, glutamic acid, and serine. Because we can make them de novo ourselves at any time, and in good quantity. Then there's six of them that we call conditionally essential, because we can make them most of the time, but not always. And these are arginine, cysteine, glutamine, glycine, proline, and tyrosine. Finally, there are nine of them that we cannot make ourselves. Histine, isoleucine, leucine, lysine, methionine, phenylalanine, threonine, tryptophan, and valine. And as a result, we have to obtain them from our diet. We call these the essential amino acids. All right, so the amino acid. Just from the name, you can tell they've got an amine group, or NH2, and also an acid, in this case, a carboxylic acid group, or COOH. The amine and carboxylic acid groups are both bound to the same carbon, called the alpha carbon. Now, at a physiologic pH of 7.4, the amine group has a positive electrical charge, and the carboxyl group has a negative charge. Having both a positive and a negative charge makes amino acids a type of zwitter ion, which is German for hybrid, or double ion. Now, the alpha carbon also has a side chain, sometimes marked as R. And this side chain gives the amino acids certain properties, which can play an important role in the overall protein structure. First, the side chain can be hydrophilic or hydrophobic, so water-loving or water-hating. Hydrophobic amino acids have nonpolar side chains. This might be in the form of an alkyl side group, which is a saturated hydrocarbon, seen in valine, glycine, alanine, leucine, isoleucine, methionine, and proline. Alternatively, it can be in the form of an aromatic side group, which involves a six-carbon ring, like in phenylalanine, tyrosine, and tryptophan. Now, hydrophilic amino acids have polar side chains. These polar side chains might be acidic, like when their side chains contain additional carboxyl groups, like aspartic acid and glutamic acid. Other hydrophilic amino acids have polar side chains that are basic, like lysine, histidine, and arginine. At physiological pH, the acidic groups lose a hydrogen, and the basic groups gain a hydrogen. Finally, some polar side chains are neutral. For example, they can contain hydroxyl groups like serine, threonine, or tyrosine, or sulfhydryl groups like cysteine, or carboxamide groups like asparagine or glutamine. Now, keep in mind that the charge on an amino acid really depends on its side chain, as well as the pH. For example, at a very low pH, the amine group is positive, while the carboxyl group is neutral. And at a very high pH, the amine group is neutral, and the carboxyl group has a negative charge. And at a pH that's somewhere in between, both groups are electrically charged, and they cancel each other out, resulting in no net charge for the amino acid. The just-right pH, also known as the PI, or isoelectric point, 
is different for every amino acid, and it depends on the specific side chains. For amino acids to link up in a chain, the carboxyl group of one amino acid has to bind to the amine group on another amino acid, creating a single peptide bond. This is a condensation reaction, meaning that two amino acids are basically smushed together, and the OH from the carboxyl group along with one of the hydrogens from the amine group get released as a water molecule in the formation of an amide bond. While technically being a single bond, it actually has the properties of a structurally stronger double bond, thanks to the property of resonance. Now, resonance is a property of a molecule where electrons get shared across the molecule, while keeping the arrangement of atoms the same. Basically, the electrons from neighboring functional groups in the amino acid are borrowed, and that makes peptide bonds stronger and more stable. So amino acids are, essentially, a carboxyl group, an amine group, a side chain, and a hydrogen all bound to an alpha carbon. Now, there's an interesting geometric property here called chirality, which means that each amino acid can exist in two forms that look like mirror images of each other. These two forms are called enantiomers of each other. We have the left or levo-oriented amino acids, as well as the right or dextro-oriented amino acids. While similar, these are definitely not the same. Think of it like a pair of shoes. Even though they're made out of the same materials and generally look alike, the left and the right shoe are not interchangeable, at least not without a lot of pain involved. As it turns out, proteins are only made out of level-oriented amino acids. Now, protein production itself happens in cellular structures called ribosomes, which use the messenger RNA, which is essentially a blueprint that tells the ribosome exactly the order of amino acids that are needed. At this point, the protein is just a growing string of amino acids. As it grows, it's either being injected into another organelle, called the endoplasmic reticulum, which will help the protein take shape, or it's being translated directly into the cytosol. Now, the proteins have multiple levels of structure to them, primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structure, creating a hierarchy. As an analogy, think about the alphabet. It can be used to create words, which can make simple sentences, which can further be made into complex sentences. As an example, the letters themselves would be considered the primary structure, then simple words like exam and hours would represent secondary structures. Tertiary structure would be when the entire chain folds together, maybe making a simple sentence like the exam is in two hours. And the quaternary structure might actually be a few peptide chains coming together to form a more complex protein, making a complex sentence that says the exam is in two hours and I haven't slept at all. When it comes to proteins, the primary structure is simple enough. It's just a linear sequence of amino acids connected through peptide bonds, like a string of pearls. Now, the peptide bonds between the amino acids are very rigid, but by comparison, the single bonds connecting the amide functional group of the peptide bond to the alpha carbon are flexible. That allows significant freedom of rotation, and through that rotation, the protein can fold into one of the two types of secondary structure, alpha helix or beta pleated sheets. The alpha helix resembles a spring. The helical structure brings the CO of the first amino acid near the NH of the fifth amino acid. The second CO gets near the sixth NH, and so on. In other words, each of these instances is separated by four amino acids. Having the O and H get close to one another allows for a strong hydrogen bond to form and that makes the alpha helical structure really stable. Beta pleated sheets also rely on hydrogen bonding, but slightly differently. Imagine a neatly folded piece of paper. In beta pleated sheets, hydrogen bonds form between the NH on one flap of paper and the CO on another flap of paper, and these bonds almost hold or glue the sheets together. That makes beta pleated sheets really stable as well. Now, tertiary structure is the overall shape of the polypeptide chain, and it includes the secondary structures as well as other features. For example, two sulfur-containing cysteines can bind to form a disulfide bridge. 
Also, hydrophobic amino acids form bonds with one another and orient themselves toward the inside of the protein. In that way, they avoid contact with water. It's like the hydrophobic amino acids are being a bit shy. Basically, the way a polypeptide chain twists and turns to form its tertiary structure is kind of like the way headphones get tangled up in your pocket. Quaternary structure is the final level, and it's the level at which multiple polypeptide chains come together to form a larger protein structure. A classic example involves the four polypeptide subunits that have come together to form a single hemoglobin protein, which is roughly a tetrahedral arrangement. Alright, as a quick recap, there are 20 amino acids, 5 dispensable, 6 conditionally essential, and 9 essential. The primary structure of a protein is the linear sequence of amino acids. The secondary structure includes both alpha helix or beta pleated sheets, both of which rely on hydrogen bonds. The tertiary structure binds the secondary structures through various other bond interactions like disulfide bridges or hydrophobic reactions. And the quaternary structure creates the final shape of a protein by connecting multiple polypeptides in the form of tertiary structures. Helping current and future clinicians focus, learn, retain, and thrive. Learn more.